All right, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I am Greg Murray, the Editor-in-Chief of Politics and the Life Sciences, and we're here today for our next author presentation. Note that this event is being recorded and will be distributed on social media, media and the journal's um, YouTube channel. Um, today we're going to hear from Craig Albert, Amado Baez, and Josh Rutland about their, their new PLS article, Human Security is Biosecurity, Reconceptualizing National Security Threats in Times of COVID-19, a very timely article. And by the way, this is, a, this is one of the articles in our latest issue, which is just out in the past couple of days. And I should also note that this is the article that inspired the cover art. So if you're wondering where the cover art came from, that is where that came from. Um, so I'm going to put a link to the um, paper in the chat for those <coughs> who would like that. It is um, Cambridge University Press made it free access till the end of May. So I hope you will um, go to that and, and take a look at it. And there I just chatted that for you. So nonetheless, let me take a moment and introduce the authors and then I will turn it over to them. Dr. Albert is an associate professor of political science and director of the Master of Arts in Intelligence and Security Studies at Augusta University. His areas of concentration are international, uh, include international relations, ethnic conflict, and cyber terrorism and cyber war. Dr. Baez is a board, board certified emergency medicine and critical care physician with close to three decades of experience in the convergence of government, security, in healthcare. Currently, he's a professor of emergency medicine, epidemiology, and political science at Augusta University. He's director of the Center of Operational Medicine and director for health diplomacy at the Dominican Ministry of Foreign Affairs, previous, and he previously served as a senior advisor and COVID-19 czar for the Dominican presidency. And then we've also got Josh Rutland. Josh is a graduate student in the Master of Arts in Intelligence Security Studies at Augusta University. And his research in interests include cybersecurity, biosecurity, terrorism, and international relations. So we thank them for joining us today. Thank you everyone for coming and joining us for this interesting presentation. And thank you gentlemen for sharing your research with us. Craig, the floor, sir, is yours. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And just to uh, understand, you said we had three hours for this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. All right, so as, as Dr. Murray mentioned, uh, the title of the paper is Human Security as Biosecurity, Reconceptualizing National Security Threats in the Times of COVID-19. Uh, what brought this article about was really uh, Amado and I and Dr. Murray and Josh were, were all conflicted about the conversations that were happening in the political rhetoric recently about whether or not COVID was an actual threat how dangerous of a threat it could be. Was it a threat just to individuals or could it actually be classified as a serious national security threat? And what would be its consequences on the balance of power and geopolitics? And so we wanted to then just investigate uh, and really get rid of the political rhetoric on both sides and start to understand, is this a, a serious threat? Where does it fit in relation to other infectious diseases? And in what ways, if at all, is COVID a threat to national security and international security. So this article examines to what extent and in what ways COVID-19 represents a challenge to global security. It seeks to address the question, is COVID-19 a threat to national and international security? As of October, 2020, the global daily death toll for severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, COVID-19, consistently ranged between 4,000 and 6,000 people daily with a total global death toll surpassing 1 million. That was as of October, 2020. This article argues that when viewed through the prism of human security theory and biosecurity, it becomes clear that COVID-19 is a threat to national security in the context of high politics. This thesis is evinced by the sheer numbers of individuals infected and killed, national economic losses, military preparedness and readiness, and the effects of the disease on the national health infrastructure system and public trust that would not exist without COVID-19's presence. So what we're gonna do is briefly describe the theoretical paradigms through which we analyze COVID-19. Uh, then we'll get into the epidemiology of COVID-19. And then, and that'll be Dr. Baez that does that. And then Josh, our graduate student, 
we'll go through the case study and show in each way how COVID-19 should be viewed as a threat to national and international security based on the indicators I just mentioned. So what is human security theory? Uh, in opposition to traditional notions of national security, human security focuses more on the individual or group's well-being and welfare. The human security paradigm argues that there are many more complex and varied threats to one's existence other than direct physical violence. And I should note that national security in general is a state-focused uh, paradigm. So to say something is typically a national security threat means that it has to threaten the existential being of a country, uh, the infrastructure, the military, the economic infrastructure. Uh, so to be a national security threat, it usually has to focus on the security of the state, the regime, and the government therein. Human security says that there's much more complex and varied threats to existence than these typical notions of national security threats. Uh, but human security theory argues that all of these should be included in conversations about state security, not just notions of typical national security. Although admittedly vague, the conceptualization of human security is broadly defined as an individual's freedom from want and freedom from fear. And although vague, this provides a useful comparison with national security's focus on the survival of the state. Accordingly, state security must be complemented by other elements, including human rights and public health. It must focus on everyday people rather than on the perpetuation of the state only. And elements counted as existential threats within the human security literature include economic security, political security, access to food and healthcare, personal and community safety, and environmental security. So human security then is what we know in the literature as a critical security uh, theory that goes outside the notions or the boundaries of traditional realist real politic uh, that I said earlier focuses generally on the state apparatus and its survival only without real insight into the notion of what's going on for the individual well-being of its citizens. It separates the individual well-being from state security apparatus. Whereas national security has the imperative of defending territory against external threats, human security recognizes that globally, there are significant threats to security emanating from disease, hunger, pollution, crime, and domestic violence, just to name a few. Specifically situating COVID-19 as a threat to human security, Milani argues that a compelling novelty of this pandemic is the worldwide anthropological experience of fear and death in such a short span of time. COVID-19 has expanded as a security threat that is existential in scope. She continues, the threat has reached individuals in direct, palpable, and conspicuous ways. It has touched everybody's neighborhood, families, and many households. So that quote, I think, illustrates very nicely why we chose human security theory to analyze the threat that COVID-19 presents because of how the, it caused this fear, anxiety, uh, and just general depression in the citizens that were afraid of getting COVID-19. And under human security theory, that day-to-day -day quality of living as being diminished because of these emotional and other physical features, which we'll get to in a minute, results in a, in, a, in a way that you can say it's a threat to national security that traditional notions of national security don't look at. However, we also wanted to analyze it through more traditional notions of national security as well. And the paradigm we chose for this for infectious diseases is biosecurity. So biosecurity is a nebulous term that is hard to conceptualize. The concept is usually grouped with bioterrorism and biosafety, but it is quite distinct from these and often includes measures to prevent bioterrorism and maintain biosafety measures. Gostin and Fiddler argue that biosecurity is society's collective responsibility to safeguard the population from dangers presented by pathogenic microbes, whether naturally occurring or intentionally released. As such, the author's concept incorporates threats presented by biological weapons and naturally occurring disease epidemics. So either of those can fit into biosecurity or bioterrorism, naturally occurring uh, pandemics or uh, weaponized pandemics created by a, a, an ill-intended actor. Gossett and Fiddler argue that to be a concern within the realm of biosecurity, a natural or intentionally released epidemic must have the potential to disrupt the normal functioning of societies. So there you have their understanding of what something is considered to be a national security threat under biosecurity. 
if it has the potential to disrupt the normal functioning of societies. Gossin and Fiddler also note that communicable diseases represent one of the most significant burdens of morbidity and mortality globally. And understood as such, biosecurity thus emerges at the convergence of security and public health. So just briefly to talk on health security, which is really how we try to blend uh, health, uh, uh, I'm sorry, how to blend national security with human security into this realm that exists in both these paradigms of uh, public health security or health security. And this is really uh, the, the, the matrix or the theoretical prism that we use to analyze the case study to, to describe and illustrate according to both theories through health security, how COVID is a threat to national security. So the convergence of public health and national security has been an increasing topic of discussion within the security studies literature. Intermark in 2009 argued that a particular disease may be a security issue when its effects threaten to impose an intolerable burden on society. The massive scale of the threat is what makes infectious diseases a national security threat within the biosecurity paradigm. It becomes a threat in terms of morbidity, mortality, and the perceived fear of infection and overwhelming the public health infrastructures. So that last part there is really the impetus of what creates a national security threat. And again, this is gonna be juxtaposed to the traditional notions of national security as espoused by uh, the, the, the international relations theory of realism and even the international relations theory of liberalism also known as complex interdependence, uh, not liberalism as in the political ideology, uh, liberalism as the theory of, of institutional uh, collective action. The importance of biosecurity then and its impact on public health has managed to create a paradigm existing within both fields of biosecurity and human security, and that's health security. And that's really how we examine uh, COVID-19 through the case study uh, for the rest of this paper. I'm gonna now turn it over to my far smarter colleague, Dr. Baez, who can give you the ins and outs of the uh, medical epidemiology of COVID-19. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure I am far, far smarter. I, I actually, with everything you said, I feel a little dumber just right now. Um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about SARS COVID, um, COVID 2, uh, COVID 19. So, so basically, to put it in the framework, I'm sure everybody already, after a year of this pandemic, there are a lot of uh, experts. Um, in terms of understanding what coronaviruses are and the uh, epidemiology uh, of it. Uh, so basically, uh, coronaviruses uh, are pathogens that exist in animals or humans. Uh, they have existed for a long, long time. They're not unique to COVID-19. Um, and the reason why it's called COVID-19 uh, is because it was first uh, identified at the end of 2019 uh, even though we started uh, getting more concerned about it at the beginning uh, of 2020. Uh, it can, they can infect a variety of hosts, humans, animals, and uh, if you've read the news about some of the theories in terms of wet mar markets and whatnot. Um, but one of the things that needs to be, I guess, uh, focused on in this conversation is that this is a novel virus. It's a new virus. So being a new virus, a lot of the understanding of how the virus behaves is also new. So the initial and even the current um, comparisons with other illnesses like the flu uh, and, and, and other, uh, even other coronaviruses uh, is, is not appropriate. Uh, this is a new virus that behaves very differently. Uh, we're actually seeing new variants that have different uh, epidemiological profiles. I'm back. So a lot of it, understanding how this particular disease behaves is shouldn't be a fair comparison um, when you look at the flu or, or other diseases. Uh, can we can we go to the next? Uh, in terms of epidemiology, and I think how it relates to national security, I think this is an important um, uh, set of points. So case fatality rate is basically the number of deceased individuals as compared to the calculated K 
cases. We can see that it is used as a benchmark for certain countries. Uh, there's about a 2% average. Uh, in some countries is higher, in some countries is lower. You can also use it as a point of comparison for other diseases like MERS and SARS. You can see how uh, SARS had a 10%, MERS had a 34%. The issue here is that this is a relative number that is directly related to the cases. So to the, to the earlier point, if your disease is more virulent, it's more contagious, and you have more people infected, then you're going to have a greater number of absolute cases and a greater number of hospitalizations and a greater number of critical care needs and a greater number of deaths. So saying that SARS and MERS were more lethal is appropriate if you're looking at it from a numbers, relative numbers and percentage perspective. But when you look at the how contagious COVID-19 is, uh, that is the reason why it's a pandemic and that is the reason why it has become a national security concern. A couple of new or different uh, ways of looking at the disease. Uh, the IFR is similar to the CFR, <clears throat> but the only difference is that it, it contains in the calculation zero prevalence data that gives you a broader picture of estimated uh, cases, not necessarily measured, but estimated based on your assessment of um, asymptomatic folks that never got tested. So I think this is important because not everybody gets tested. Um, when I was dealing with COVID in the Dominican Republic, uh, there were two immediate uh, early issues. One immediate early issue last year was the availability of PPE and other equipment. But then another immediate issue was the availability, uh, availability of testing resources, um, reagents, machines. So many, many countries were not able to test properly uh, the cases. So a lot of these numbers were not really accurate uh, from a CFR, from an objective testing perspective. Uh, but, but however, for example, we did use rapid um, antibody kits to do seroprevalence studies. So we had a, a little bit of a better idea of what the epidemiological profile was using cheaper resources that, that were available at that time. One number that we have been using, and it's used as a used, um, for example, some countries have used it for uh, opening and closing decisions uh, in terms of confinement is the R number. Uh, R naught and RT are a little bit different. The R zero looks at the whole picture of the disease. And um, basically it, it looks at how many individuals, how many individuals that have the disease affect how many other individuals? So it looks at if I have COVID and I am infecting one or two or three other individuals, that is how the R0 or R0 is um, defined. There's a little bit of discussion in the epidemiological world with regards to the difference between RT or effective reproduction number and the R0. Um, and some, some folks say that the R0 or R0 looks at the totality of the disease and then the RT can look at regional variabilities. And I think that's an important point because you, ha you do have variants that have different transmissibility and uh, different capabilities of uh, um, uh, transmissibility or reproduction. Uh, so if, if you look at the whole world, you can have an, R, an R0. If you look at a whole country, you can have an R0 that looks at uh, the whole country profile. Uh, but then if you want to look at specific variants that might be developing in a specific region, uh, some epidemiologists say it's, it's more semantics that you use the RT number. But this is, a, this is a tool that gives you an understanding of how fast the disease is progressing. And uh, for me, for example, when I was running COVID last year in, in Dominican Republic with a population of 11 million, we used uh, epidemiological signals to actually enhance um, hospital capacity. 
So we would look at what's happening in Europe and the US as, a, as an early signal in terms of what could be happening in our country. We actually use the R uh, number, so the effective reproduction number, as an early warning sign of how things might look uh, two weeks later. We use the positivity rate as an early warning sign that comes after the R0, but it actually predicts a little bit how hospital capacity is going to be used. So we use this epidemiologic intelligence to predict with a fair precision four to five weeks uh, earlier how the hospital system is going to be taxed and told so we could do enhancements and augmentation of the hospital system. So this is one, one way of looking at it. Um, can we go to the next? I think the this is an interesting one when you look at um, national security, for example. I think uh, Craig was talking a little bit about the differences between uh, biosecurity, human security, national security. Um, it you know, and I'm learning all these uh, new things with regards to uh, COVID and national security. I think we're all learning, um, but for example, if you look at uh, security issues. You can have a big disease that affects a whole country, or you can have a specific disease, a specific pathogen that affects a critical area of the country's operability. Um, in this case, when you look at the R number, the R number looks at the, the ideally the country epidemiologic picture or the state epidemiologic picture, but the dispersion parameter or K number can look at specifically what's going on in a subset uh, of that region. Uh, for example, if you want to look at deployment readiness and military bases, if you want to look at a specific law enforcement agency, if you want to look at a specific critical uh, infrastructure component uh, and the people that work there, then you can use the K number. The K number contemplates, it's actually a little bit opposite of the R number. The lower the K number, the worse it is. Um, and it looks, um, specifically at uh, a variation in the reproduction number <clears throat> and variation within the distribution. So it's a number that contemplates uh, super spreader events. And it also, I think it's interesting when you're looking at how a specific variant is behaving within a specific community. Uh, for example, here in Augusta, we have Fort Gordon, uh, which is a very important cybersecurity facility. Uh, when you look at deployment readiness, and I think this is one of the elements that, that, that creates that convergence uh, between national security and uh, COVID, uh, military assets have to be quarantined for a couple of weeks before they deploy. Uh, if you have an outbreak in a military base, and that creates an issue with readiness. Uh, and these are epidemiologic tools that look at different angles. Um, so ideally, you can use the RT as a specific subset um, uh, of a community. Uh, you can look at the K number uh, as well. Um, and so these are different angles of looking at the same data. Uh, and I, you know, and I hope I just wanted to frame it within this uh, picture of how the these epidemiologic intelligence signals, data signals can affect um, some of the items that we are talking about here with regards to national security. And, and I just highlighted uh, deployment readiness, military assets, and law enforcement assets. Um, so I'm done with my part and I'll be available at the end for any questions. All right, Josh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Albert, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to be covering the case study portion of the presentation, as Dr. Albert said, which focuses primarily on some of the impacts of COVID, and in particular on the U.S. We're going to start with the death toll. Now, Although the death rate of COVID-19 is lower than SARS or MERS, as Dr. Baez discussed previously, the total number of deaths from the disease thus far makes it the deadliest of the three coronaviruses. By June 3rd of last year, the virus had killed more Americans than the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Afghanistan War, and the Iraq War combined. By the end of 2020, the global death count for COVID-19 was at 1.82 million. And as of this past Monday, Approximately 3.2 million deaths had occurred globally from the virus, with approximately 572,000 of those having occurred in the U.S. alone. For comparison's sake, worldwide deaths associated with seasonal influenza, to which the virus was often inappropriately compared, 
vary each year from around 290,000 to 650,000. So clearly this makes COVID-19 a threat according to human security theory and biosecurity. Next slide, please. Now, looking at the economic impacts, the economic impacts of COVID-19 have also been staggering both globally and within the U.S. Domestically, the damage to the U.S. stock market has rivaled the effects of Black Monday in October of 1987 and has surpassed the effects of the 1918 Spanish flu and the 2008 market crisis. The U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta has estimated the eventual impact will likely be around a 4% drop in GDP for the U.S., and globally, the International Monetary Fund has forecasted a total 3% global GDP decline as a result of the virus. China's official assessment as a comparison indicates that its GDP fell by about 6.8% in the first quarter of 2020 as compared to the first quarter of 2019. Next slide. Unemployment rates have also skyrocketed domestically with the proportion of people out of work reaching about 10.4% in the US alone. This seeming end to a decade of expansion for one of the world's largest economies has prompted fears of a new recession for a lot of people. Next, we're gonna look at some of the impacts on the health system. The public health sector has been battered and permanently altered by COVID-19. Pandemic underpreparedness as exemplified by PPE shortages, inadequate hospital capacities and inefficient testing and case tracking has inflated the infection rates and the death count associated with the virus. As a result, resources have also been diverted and reorganized in attempts to better manage the pandemic, with elective procedures being decreased or halted altogether. This represents a clear threat according to human security theory. Another area which has suffered significantly at all levels due to COVID-19 is government trust and effectiveness. Local, state, and federal authorities, the presidency, and the party system legitimacy have all been called into question throughout the crisis. Globally, the increase of conspiracy theories and nationalist authoritarian movements in response to the pandemic have eroded public trust as well. This erosion has been further aggravated by widespread outrage with state officials flouting of virus guidelines, heightened socio-political tensions, and lack of transparent communication from officials. The politicization of masks and stay-at-home orders, which has likely worsened the virus's impact in some areas, is only one example of the dangerous consequences that can be associated with degraded government trust like this. Concerning the military, militaries around the world have been impacted by COVID-19 in terms of readiness and preparedness. The US military is no exception. As of October, 2020, the Department of Defense estimated around 76,000 service members had been infected with the virus, resulting in around 1,600 hospitalizations, 52,000 recoveries, and 102 deaths. Logistically, social distancing protocols have forced the restructuring of training formats and a decrease in recruitment efforts, and operational assets have had to be reassigned in various capacities to combat the virus. One such example would include the activation of the National Guard in several states to help maintain test sites. While these efforts demonstrate the ability of a competent and effective military to combat a pandemic, the potential remains for a state's ability to defend itself to be compromised should outbreaks spread across the military. The pandemic has also prompted concerns regarding terrorism. As several terrorist organizations have called for attacks on hospitals and other vulnerable sites in the United Kingdom and several other regions during the pandemic. ISIS and Al-Qaeda in particular have used the virus as an operational tool by declaring it a soldier of Allah and framing it as a divine punishment targeting all non-believers. The virus has also renewed fears of bioterrorism with some fearing that it could represent a blueprint and inspiration for future bioterrorist plots. COVID-19's impacts have also extended beyond the physical world, with bots churning out copious amounts of disinformation on social media. At least 70% of all COVID-19-related information on Twitter, as of this paper's writing, was published exclusively by bots. Russian bots, in particular, have promoted two disinformation campaigns, the intentional engineering and deployment of COVID-19 as a bioweapon, and the idea that the pandemic is just a method to obscure harmful effects of new 5G towers. Cyber attacks have also increased dramatically throughout the pandemic, which is likely a result of stay-at-home protocols that force would-be attackers to remain in their homes with greater amounts of free time. A couple of examples include remote desktop protocol attacks, which increased by 400% in March and April of 2020, email scams, which have increased by 667% as of March 2020, 
And interestingly, a 2000% increase in the number of malicious files trafficked with the word Zoom in their name. So thankfully none of you all were affected by that today, but you can see how big of an issue that could be in the modern world. <laughs> and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Albert now who will cover our conclusion. Thanks Josh, that was awesome. Uh, the consequences for human health and safety and the effects on hospital infrastructure, the national and global economy, and militaries worldwide demonstrate clearly that COVID-19 is a security threat according to both the human security theory and biosecurity frameworks. It is a threat to the health and well-being of citizens and to the global economy, and it has threatened the capabilities of armed services worldwide. Additionally, the presence of COVID-19 has amplified geopolitical tensions the threat from terrorists seeking to take advantage of the opportunity during the pandemic and cyber attacks. So in other words, it not just affected the health and well-being of citizens, but it also had these massive uh, geopolitical tensions that are considered uh, national security threats according to traditional notions of realism or liberalism or what else is also known as complex interdependence. So no matter how you look at it, COVID-19, according to the prestigious authors presenting today, should be considered a threat to national and international security. Uh, and in the last part of the paper, which, which again, we're all welcome for, to you to read and then send more questions to us after this, states that if the pandemic continues to surge throughout the winter of 20 and 21, the potential for even greater worldwide catastrophic events exist, amplifying the call to consider COVID-19 a threat to national security. Uh, thank you all, and I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Murray. There we go. All righty. Thank you, gentlemen. Nice presentation. Very interesting presentation. So what we'd like to do, we've got a little bit less than 30 minutes left. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for questions. We can do it. Uh, I kind of prefer you just pop in and... and um, ask a question, but you can also do it by chat if I can find my chat. There it is, my chat window again. So does anybody have any questions they would like to ask any of the authors? Hey, gentlemen, this is Jay Hustlin. Uh, can I jump in? Of course, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, well, first off, I really enjoyed the article um, very, very much. And I, I want to say I think you really made a strong case for connecting the uh, you know, issues of biosecurity and, uh, and human security. And uh, I just wanted to comment, um, uh, it wasn't soon after I read your article that I, I was just um, perusing some, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of these sites that I go to occasionally just to, you know, check out uh, uh, most recent social science research. And I came across a, an article in the Journal of Social, uh, Psychological, and Personality Science that suggests that the uh, existential threat brought on by uh, COVID-19 the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic can, can spur the expression of uh, anti-immigrant and nationalist beliefs among authoritarians. And um, I thought, you know, I thought that was really, really um, interesting. And I know, you know, you guys, uh, you know, touched on this as far as the increase in authoritarian movements and things like this. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, as uh, Dr. Albert pointed out, is, you know, the, longest, the longer this uh, pandemic goes on, you know, I, I, you know, the, the, the more risk there is for the, these type of fallout. So, I, you know, I think going forward, if we don't really get a handle on this, we're going to start seeing a lot more, you know, sort of anti-immigrant uh, discriminatory behavior towards out groups and that sort of thing. And, you know, as you guys all know, that, um, that those type of uh, um, views can, can, you know, lead, uh, eventually lead to sort of mass violence and create problems with in, independently displaced persons and the associated political instability. So anyway, all that kind of came together and I think really helped buttress, uh, not that you, you, know, you needed any buttressing of your thesis, but I think it really just um, uh, helped me paint a really you know, kind of clear picture uh, for what some of the implications are. So anyway, it's just more of a comment. I don't, I don't know if you have any, uh, if the authors have any uh, comments on what I had to say, but uh, it just all, all sort of came together very nicely. But anyway, ni nice job. And I thought it was a really, really interesting piece of work. Thanks, Jay. On the on that last part of the kind of in the conclusion, we talk about kind of the perfect storm of a, of a catastrophic threat from COVID-19 if things did not lessen. And in there, we talk about, you know, what could potentially happen if uh, the governments worldwide could not control its spread very much. And, and that included uh, going as far as, you know, interstate conflict because of refugees in some of the lesser developed countries being 
you know, trying to leave and go to other court countries to get more protection, it could have created some type of border chaos, clashes, refugee uh, chaos, migration chaos, and, and eventually led to serious mm -hmm. geopolitical tensions. And what's also in the paper is the discussion between, uh, and we just touched on this a little bit, but, but we're trying to do some more research on this now, is kind of the, the reputational legitimacy of the balance of power. Uh, so, you know, Russia's power has been increased as well as China's during this relative to the United States because of their rollout of the vaccine and the perception that the, the disease didn't hit their countries as bad as it did the United States. So obviously we can't trust either the uh, assessments released by the governments of the state of Russia and the state of China. But the idea is that they handled it more effectively and efficaciously and that their vaccines were developed quick, more quickly and better. And then even more so the diplomatic reputation of Russia has increased because it has been given its vaccine to lesser developed countries, whereas the United States has been buying more vaccines than the United States actually needs. And so it looks like the United States is hoarding uh, something that the rest of the world needs, whereas Russia is providing it to the rest of the world. Uh, so, there's, so there's even some geopolitical tensions in that and a, and a slight redistribution of, of the balance of power which even according to realists or more traditional understandings of national security, that's a serious threat when that shifts of power starts to, to, to uh, shift. And, and the theory in realism is that when there's a, a significant shift uh, from, a, from a contender state, which would be Russia in this uh, case, or the challenger state or revisionist state, as opposed to the United States, which is a status quo states, right? Because we like the power that we have in the international system, we wanna stay the same. Uh, but according to power transition theory, when one state becomes a revisionist actor and starts to seek an increase in its power and the, the unipol starts to decrease and even its perceived chances of power, the catalyst or the likelihood that those two states come in direct kinetic conflict increases remarkably. Uh, and the theory tests that even uh, since you know the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. So this is something I know a lot of people in the United States especially are getting tired of COVID restrictions and things of this nature. Uh, but as the different variants, which might be, a, a, you know, non-effective to the vaccinations that are going around now, especially with the Indian variant, they, they're not sure if it's going to be able to, it looks like it's creaking, you know, seeping through the vaccine so that the vaccine is not as, and Dr. Baez might be able to talk about, he will be able to discuss this more than I can, uh, but, but that means that uh, as bad as it was in, you know, April of last year, we could see that again with some of these variants which means this, this perfect storm might resurface just to, to your point a little more. Thank you, Brad. Okay, other questions? Nothing right now? So I, I, cover, I have questions, but I, one thing that I thought was interesting was the comment that you guys made about 70% of the information on Twitter um, comes from Russian bots related, or 70% of the COVID information comes from Russian bots. And clearly, I mean, that's a pattern that's being established where countries are interfering in each other's domestic issues, um, you know, by that. But where the, I'm, I am wondering, it doesn't sound like that was specifically targeted towards the U.S. If 70% of the, of the COVID information um, on Twitter is from Russian, Russian bots. I mean, that's not just targeted necessarily at U.S., is it? It would be targeted at what? The whole, I don't know, the entire Western, you know, Twitter using verse. Is that what that is? Or what do you think the target is on that? It would be Twitter wide, but it, it is a directed information operation against the United States, particularly, and other Western allies as well. And what Russia's goal there is to, and this has been its goal in active measures and propaganda for 300 years, uh, is to divide the population of its adversaries internally to create chaos and sow discord. So Russia infiltrates through its operations online, uh, the public sentiment and really seeks to take the streams of both sides and push them further away. And so it's, it does this with the anti-vaxxing movement. It does this with you know the 5G, uh, conspiracy, and it's done this with COVID-19 as well, seeking to create and sow division within the United States. Its idea being that uh, it, it would like to, to create a full insurrection or a civil war in the United States, uh, obviously bringing down the power of the United States worldwide, whereas you know, Russia will be there to, to 
step in and save the world from a declining superpower state. Yeah. So one thing that I wanted to comment there, it's kind of interesting <clears throat> that 70% is also the herd or collective immunity number. So it almost seems like it's a target uh, herd disinformation, right? Um, one, of, one of the interesting things I think that somewhat relates to this is um, Craig mentioned uh, revisionist models of government. Uh, but, you know, one could argue that the political transition in the U.S. has created revisionist policies. And, those, and that has actually been capitalized as an opportunity for other um, states to use the transition, the differences of, of opinion and policy and politics and position themselves in terms of international aid. Um, the initial America first view uh, created that perspective of let's get all the vaccines to the US so we can get our population vaccinated first. And that opened up a lot of opportunities in other countries like Craig said, uh, with regards to assistance, not just from the vaccine perspective, initial assistance regarding PPE and ventilation equipment and reagents. And now we're seeing it uh, for sure. I can give you a case example. Uh, the US decided to bet on their uh, international cooperation uh, framework for vaccines was the COVAX uh, framework for, uh, of the World Health and Pan American Health Organization. For different reasons, one, vaccines of choice, logistic platforms, pr production, COVAX has been extremely delayed. And I can give you the case example of Dominican Republic, uh, over a million plus vaccines have been, I would say 1.5 million or more have been given in the Dominican Republic, 90,000 uh, have been from the COVAX uh, mechanism where the promise for COVAX was a 20%. So they're, they're extremely short. Um, when you ask the US leadership, what are you doing to control this outside of the US? They, they talk about the billions of dollars donated to the COVAX framework, but the COVAX framework has not launched uh, effectively. And one of the issues that one has to see is, this is a global problem. This is a pandemic by definition and global problem. If countries choose to take care of the problem within the geography of their country, they're not really seeing the totality of what this is. If Canada or Mexico doesn't do a good job vaccinating, and because of the reproduction of the disease in their countries, you get more variants that are more resistant to the vaccines being deployed in the US, the US will suffer geographically from geographically connected countries that will have uh, different variants that might um, be associated with ineffectiveness of the, of the vaccine, not to mention port entry. Um, if for the economy, and a lot of the countries are battling between the economy, public health and civil rights, for the economy to effectively relaunch, uh, this is a globally connected um, you know, e economy, right? So for that to happen, uh, there are countries that depend on tourism, there are countries that depend on maritime uh, channels. And if the individuals that arrive via plane or boats uh, don't have uh, the vaccines uh, and, and are carrying asymptomatically different variants, that can also create a problem. Um, so I think the, the issue here is for sure, looking at some of these uh, the geopolitical moves uh, and some of those uh, power items that Craig uh, talked about, uh, that is, is uh, being objectively seen uh, in many, many countries outside of the US, when you start knocking on doors for international cooperation um, and the focus of the US is more, let's get this taken care of internally uh, and not necessarily understand that there are a lot of other actors making their move uh, via the channels of international cooperation, vaccine diplomacy and health diplomacy. Uh, this is Susan Wright. I'm on the screen as SW, so I'm a little bit anonymous, but I want to follow up on what Amado has just said. Um, it seems that the concepts that you're laying out very nicely in the paper do very different work. Human security is based on 
the, the whole concept of global institutions, the World Health Organization and COVAX as a motto said, whereas national, is in, uh, national security focuses on the security of the state. And I think, uh, I think it, the conversation has brought out already the behavior of this virus suggests that national security is not capable of recognizing its limitations because the virus knows no national boundaries. And so I, th I think our, our experience today is showing how important the uh, global institutions are for dealing with something like a pandemic in the world um, and how important it is for all countries to have some level of preparation. And we've learned in this country that we weren't prepared adequately, but certainly that's true of, for example, India today, where the situation is, dis is absolute disaster. So it's interesting that these concepts do very different work politically. Um, just wanted to emphasize that. I, well, one other comment is that biosecurity, I agree with Craig, it's a very vague concept. And when you look at this, the history of the idea, it sort of emerged in around 2000, at least that's my impression, um, after uh, Clinton, President Clinton uh, announced that the National Institutes of Health would be responsible for biodefense research. And, you know, the famous Anthony Fauci, the head of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, was present at that, that time and, and um, enthusiastically endorsed that transfer. Um, but what it did was to mix up the responsibilities of the Department of Defense for the defense of the nation and the responsibilities of the Department of Health and Human Services for public health. And I think the, the word biosecurity came out of that merging of those functions in a way that is, as you say, nebulous, vague, and not very well defined. So um, I think human security is a much clearer defined concept than biosecurity in many ways. But thank you for the paper. I really, really enjoyed listening to you all. Thank you for those comments. The, the, in, the, in the military realm, and especially in the United States, the, the idea of low politics or uh, human security theory is something that unfortunately most leaders don't pay attention to. And this is why things such as you know, environmental change or uh, you know, water security, food security don't really add up in our national in the United States' national security strategy because uh, DOD personnel don't really consider if it's not a direct existential threat militarily, then it's not an issue of national security. But you're, and so what we're arguing is that kind of uh, DOD is, is unprepared to handle the globalized world because it, it discounts these issues so easily. And if you just look at the numbers, right, of, you know, what Josh had said that just 570,000 deaths in the U.S. alone, greater than all the wars, you know, in the last two centuries combined for the U.S., maybe not the Civil War. I don't, I don't know if we went that far back, but I mean, how can it not be considered as such a, a national security threat with that amount of, of people dead? And some are, will argue that's not the same as a threat to the existence, but it is if you if that many of population died, the economic infrastructure and everything else that was mentioned with military preparedness, they're unable to deploy, that's a direct threat. Uh, but the, there's so many people that still don't want to consider human security. And so we wanted to put it in biosecurity terms as well, so that people could see no matter what theory one chooses to analyze COVID through, it's still a threat, uh, whether it's in terms of, you know, death and destruction that'll, that'll fit into national security prisms more easily, or if, if you want to talk about the well-being or fear of, or anxious inducing depression, anxiety inducing depression that COVID has created in so many neighborhoods in the United States, uh, just to focus on that case study, like it's a threat in each of these. And what's interesting, you know, uh, what you were saying is George W. Bush, for instance, 
it was the first president to put, you know, biosecurity or infectious diseases in the national security strategy. So it's an official part of the national security strategy of the United States is to protect from infectious diseases. Uh, president Obama took that, that trend from George W. Bush and really amped it up and created, you know, infectious disease SWAT teams, uh, created a, a sophisticated intelligence epidemiology intelligence surveillance system, uh, created the national stockpile or really increased or added to the national stockpile of PPEs and uh, the, the other things needed to fight infectious diseases, especially after he, you know President Obama saw SARS and had to deal with Ebola as well in Africa, looking at how that could affect the infrastructure of the public health system. And then we try to say nonpartisan, of course, in political science, but what we can say is for sure that President Trump's uh, decision, he dismantled almost that entire infectious disease apparatus established by Obama and George W. Bush. And so uh, he thought it was an issue of deregulation and to handle it back to the states, to throw all this stuff back to the states. And COVID came at the, the perfect wrong time uh, for especially American uh, domestic policy with this because of how much uh, President Trump at the time devolved the centralization of infectious disease control back to the states. And so what had been built up for 16 years under two former administrations was uh, wiped out under under President Trump. And his idea was that it should go to the states, but uh, so I want to be fair to, to his idea, but the states proved uh, incapable of effectively, quickly and efficaciously uh, you know, preventing COVID-19 uh, from, from merging, from, from being transmitted more. And so, and now we see President Biden is trying to reestablish that from a lessons learned from COVID-19. Uh, it's, it's too early to tell how good of a job he's doing, uh, but, but that his policy is to, to go back to Obama and even George W. Bush's uh, national security and focus of infectious diseases. You know, one of the things that I wanted to add, uh, you know, those are all great points, Greg, is we should probably take a step back and think of how this is not just a U.S. problem, right? It's a global problem. And uh, the military national security investment out of the GDP that the U.S. has is not comparable uh, to any other country, right? So mm -hmm. what a lot of countries are experiencing is the economy has contracted. So uh, uh, world economies are being significantly affected by COVID. Uh, military, law enforcement, national security assets are being allocated to COVID response, logistics, vaccination sites. So that also creates a shift in terms of uh, readiness, in terms of, um, for example, one of the things that we did in Dominican is that we used the, the C5I, the, the, the cybersecurity uh, center, we used it for epidemiologic intelligence. So the idea was that the immediate threat was or is COVID. So a lot of these resources are being shifted to COVID. And the question is what happens to other threats and the ability to respond to other threats and uh, the speed uh, of response. So, so I think that, that that's something important to think about because the U.S. is very unique in terms of the investment uh, of the military infrastructure and national security infrastructure. Not every country has uh, all those funds. Uh, so it's almost like you're a hot potato kind of phenomenon. COVID is the problem, let's focus here. And, and not necessarily, there are a lot of unknown unknowns that can open up uh, because of that shift. Great point. We've got, we've got time for probably one more question. I want to make sure we got the question in the chat from John Wilkerson. John writes, please discuss why sharing COVID resources helps improve U.S. human security. I, I think we've briefly touched on it, but it involves the idea that uh, because the disease knows no border, right? So if, if the United States keeps the, the resources to itself, that still allows for, like Dr. Baez was saying with Mexico and Canada, if, if they can't control theirs, right? Or if India can't control theirs and people keep flying in and out or the disease doesn't respect the borders then it's gonna come back and mutated or transmutated form. And it, that new form or mutation, and I'll let Dr. Disease discuss this better, right? Uh, might be, you know, uh, immune to the vac vaccinations that we've had, or it could cause 
or it could shift into, from what I understand, like it's genetic makeup could completely shift and pre present something completely new. Uh, and that new form could be even deadlier than the original uh, COVID-19. And so if the U.S. doesn't share and help the, the rest of the world, it's likely to come back and bite the U.S. Uh, because of the way infectious diseases work. And I'll, I'll let Amato correct me on anything I messed up there. No, absolutely. So, so the point is that the whole, whole world is interconnected. Uh, this disease started far away, and now it's affecting the whole world. Um, we're seeing uh, on this hemisphere, Brazil, dealing with a lot of issues. Uh, we see on the other side of the world, India, dealing with a lot of issues. Um, but we are all interconnected. I don't know if you remember a, couple, a few weeks ago, uh, there were uh, some CDC reports about new variants in New York City. Do you remember the New York City variants? Yep. By the way, I am opposed the same way we don't use the country of origin to describe the disease. We shouldn't use the country of origin to this, describe the, the variants. I think it's, a, you know, there's a symmetry component and um, I think it allows the discussion to be polarized and criticize certain countries mm -hmm. and create hate like we're seeing right now with the Asian American uh, community. Uh, but going back to New York, it just so happens, and this is just a reflection of how the world is connected. New York City, Manhattan is a super city. It's a mega city. Um, the place where they describe that particular variant is Washington Heights. Washington Heights is made up mostly of Dominican diaspora. So in the Dominican Republic, we started getting concerned, how is this new variant in New York City going to affect us? Since these are the folks who are traveling and visiting um, and in, in both ways, even with travel restrictions, there's still some mobility. Uh, so that's just an example of, of our world, my world in particular, but the whole world is connected. And the more people get sick, the more you have variants and those variants can be weaker or stronger. And if you get stronger variants that are resistant to the vaccines, then we're in trouble. Mm. All right, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Craig, Amato, and Josh. You guys did a very interesting presentation today. I'm glad to, I was glad to have a chance for you guys to share it with everybody more broadly. Thank you, um, people, for stopping in. Susan, thanks. Susan Wright is a member of the editorial board of PLS, and I really appreciate her being, being here today. And awesome. uh, thank you all, and we will wrap up there. And I'm going to stop recording right now. <laughs>